For some years, I haven't been able to give lectures. It, it was a little bit like experiencing stage fright, but without the fear. I found that if I gave lectures, I would end up depressed or frustrated. Um, I think really because I felt unable to resolve what I saw as the problems of the form. And this, of course, is something to do with speaking and listening, which is uh, what we've been hearing about in the last two presentations by Chabier and Pedro. But here I am. <laughs> and if I'm asked to uh, give a lecture, the only way I can resolve the problem for myself is to think of the lecture as an instrument. So, um, what I bring here is an instrument.
This is the sound, very faint, of Rolf Julius speaking to me in his apartment in Berlin in 2003. Rolf Julius was a, a beautiful artist working with sound. He's dead now. But he was one of the pioneers of this kind of thinking that we're considering in festivals like this. I suppose the difficulty for me is, is um, centered on the disparity of means. Um, this idea of um, a taxonomy, if you like, of, of a practice. And I prefer to think of a f what I call a fluidity of practice. in which all the elements of the practice are entangled and inseparable. And so that there's a, this deep connection that exists between the way that we engage with the world um, in whatever our specialism, in my case, music, sound and listening, um, it comes together in one form. And in a sense, it doesn't matter what we call that form. On Sunday, I'm going to be performing with Rie Nakajima and Aki Onda, Akio Suzuki. When Rie and I started working together, we devised a, a format called sculpture, whereby we would, we would invite um, artists from different practices to give a performance together. And all of the performances would be in sequence. And the only thing that we insisted on was the choice of a duration. But we wanted to get away from this idea of performance. Um, because performance is not applicable to every practice. So we decided to call these events sculpture. And everything that was a part of the event was a sculpture. And in the same way, in relation to my own personal practice, everything I do is an instrument. It's part of an instrument. So... One way I have of thinking of this is organology without bodies. Um, that, of course, flips the Deleuzian idea, or originally Antonin Arto idea, of bodies without organs. That organology is the study of musical instruments, these instruments have um, no bodies, or they have bodies that are conglomerates or assemblages. And this is what um, Jane Bennett said about assemblages in her book, Vibrant Matter. Assemblages are ad hoc groupings of diverse elements of vibrant materials of all sorts. Assemblages are living, throbbing confederations that are able to function despite the persistent presence of energies that confine them from within. They have uneven topographies because some of the points at which the various affects and bodies cross paths 
are now more heavily trafficked than others, and so power is not distributed equally across its surface. Assemblages are not governed by any central head. No one materiality or type of material has sufficient competence to determine consistently the trajectory or impact of the group. The effects generated by an, by an assemblage are, rather, emergent properties. Emergent in that their ability to make something happen is distinct from the sum of the vital force of each materiality considered alone. Each member and proto-member of the assemblage has a certain vital force, but there is also an affectivity proper to the grouping as such, an agency of the assemblage. And precisely because each member actant maintains an energetic pulse slightly off from that of the assemblage, an assemblage is never a stolid block, but an open-ended collective. It's a non-totalizable sum. An assemblage thus not only has a distinctive history of formation, but a finite lifespan. This is from Philip Short's book, Pol Pot, The History of a Nightmare. Where the Chinese communists at a similar stage in their civil war had used bugles to communicate, the Cambodians employed wooden flutes whose banshee-like wails echoing through the night air instilled terror into their opponents. This is from Peter Sloterdijk's book, Bubbles. In this passage, he's talking about um, Alfred Tomatis, um, who developed a kind of alternative therapy based on listening. I'm not sure what I think about this. Therapy. It's it's uh, as I understand it. It's a way of um, playing music to people, um, particularly Mozart. Playing Mozart's music, not playing music to Mozart, <laughs> and um, using filtering and equalization to constantly um, vary the signal. Um, and according to his theory, this surprises and stimulates the brain and, and thus can supposedly cure all kinds of problems. Um, in a way, it's a description of what people of, like me do um, as a normal part of their practice. So um, I suppose, um, according to that reasoning, people like me shouldn't have any problems at all, which is <laughs> um, not the case. But anyway, it's a passing reference to this man, Tomatis. According to Tomatis, he, he says, it is the overtones of the mother's soprano voice, in particular, that offers an irresistible stimulus of joy. To make these claims plausible, Tomatis interpreted the mother's entire body as a musical instrument albeit one that does not serve to play a piece to the listener, but rather brings about the original tuning of the ear. The transmission of high and extremely fr high frequencies in the soft, sound-swallowing -swall bodily milieu is enabled, according to Tomatis, by the unusual conductivity and resonant quality of the skeleton 
the mother's pelvis in particular is supposedly capable of conveying the subtlest high frequency vibrations of the mother's voice to the child's ear like the back of a cello and pushing this idea further uh, Sloterdijk also says humans emerge without exception from a vocal matriarchy This is um, Ralph Ellison writing in Invisible Man, which was written in 1952. Now I have one radio phonograph. I plan to have five. There is a certain acoustical deadness in my hole. And when I have music, I want to feel its vibration, not only with my ear, but with my whole body. I'd like to hear five recordings of Louis Armstrong playing and singing What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue? All at the same time. Sometimes now I listen to Louis while I have my favorite dessert of vanilla ice cream and slow gin. I pour the red liquid over the white, white mound, watching it glisten and the vapor rising as Lewis bends that military instrument into a beam of lyrical sound. Perhaps I like Louis Armstrong because he's made poetry out of being invisible. I think it must be because he's unaware that he is invisible. And my own grasp of invisibility aids me to understand his music. Once when I asked for a cigarette, some jokers gave me a reefer, which I lighted when I got home and sat listening to my phonograph. It was a strange evening. Invisibility, let me explain, gives me a slightly different sense of time. You're never quite on the beat. Sometimes you're ahead and sometimes behind. Instead of the swift and imperceptible flying of time, you are aware of its nodes, those point was points where time stands still or from which it leaps ahead. And you slip into the brakes and look around. That's what you hear vaguely in Lewis's music. This is from an interview with Pauline Oliveras. I was very interested in small found objects that I would attach to apple boxes. You know those wooden apple crates made great resonators? I would use things like curb scrapers from cars and little things that vibrated. The box would amplify the sounds and I would pick them up with microphones air mics and contact mics as well. I think I use my voice too. I use cardboard tubes to filter sounds, bathtub reverberation and whatever. It was a kind of manic, mechanical analog way of putting sounds together. And then I would do variable speed and drop things an octave or push them up. Mostly it was dropping things. This, this passage relates very strongly to uh, Xabier's ox carts. It's basically the same principle. 
but from fiction. It, it's from a novel called The Virginian by Owen Worcester, which was written in 1902. And The Virginian is considered maybe the first example of the Western. So in a way it's a template on which Western fiction and cinema is based. This seemingly respectable man now, now came dragging some sort of apparatus from his place, helped by the Virginian. The cowboys cheered because they knew what this was. The man in the window likewise recognized it and uttered a groan, came immediately out and joined us. What it was I also learned in a few minutes, for we found a house where the people made no sign at either, either our fiddlers or our knocking. And then the infernal machine was set to work. Its parts seemed to be no more than an empty keg and a plank. Some citizen informed me that I should have some, I should soon have some new idea of noise, and I ner nerved myself for something severe in the way of gunpowder. But the Virginian and the proprietor now sat on the ground, holding the keg braced, and two others got down, apparently to place seesaw over the top of it with a plank. But the keg and the plank had been rubbed with rosin, and they drew the plank back and forth over the keg. Do you know the sound made in a narrow street by a dray loaded with strips of iron? That noise is a lullaby compared with the staggering, blinding bellow which rose from the keg. If you were to try it in your native town, you would be hanged and everybody would be glad and the clergyman would not bury you. My head, my teeth, the whole system of my bones leaped and chattered at the din and out of the house like drops squirted from a lemon came a man and his wife. This is Carlo Rovelli from his book, The Order of Time. The world is not so much made of stones as of fleeting sounds, or of waves moving through the sea. Things in themselves are only events that for a while are monotonous. And this is Rebecca Solnit from The Mother of All Questions, Further Feminisms. The tranquility of a quiet place, of quieting one's own mind, of a retreat from words and bustle, is acoustically the same as the silence of intimidation or repression but psychically and politically something entirely different. What is unsaid because serenity and introspection are sought is as different from what is not said because the threats are high and the barriers are great as swimming is from drowning. Quiet is to noise as silence is to communication. The quiet of the listener makes room for the speech of others, like the quiet of the reader taking in words on the page, like the white of the paper taking ink. And another passage from the same book. 
Our subject in this book is that subspecies of silence and silencing, specific to women, if anything can be specific to more than half of humanity. If to have a voice, to be allowed to speak, to be heard and believed is essential to being an insider or a person of power, a human being with full membership, then it's important to recognize that silence is the universal condition of oppression and there are many kinds of silence and of the silenced. And this is from a book called Beyond Words by Carl Safina. A researcher once played a recording of an elephant who had died. The sound emanated from a loudspeaker hidden in a thicket. The family went wild, calling, looking all around. The dead elephant's daughter called for days afterwards. The researchers never again did such a thing. Okay, that's enough. Thank you.